Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first board meeting of the new year, the new school year, that is. Uh, we are welcoming everybody to our first portion of tonight's schedule of meetings, which is the annual organizational meeting. Uh, at the annual organizational meeting, the superintendent, which is me, will preside over the meeting until such time as new board officers or new board president is elected. Uh, so I would ask at this time to call the meeting to order. Uh, and we will uh, call attendance. Mr. Buno is in attendance. Mr. Mann is in attendance. Mr. Taylor is in attendance. Mrs. Muth is in attendance. And Mr. Dunn is in attendance. And Mrs. Smirsky will be late. Uh, Mrs. Curtin will be a little bit late. And I believe Ms. Massey will be joining us late. So with that, I would ask that uh, everyone rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our first item of business is the administration of the oath of offices by our district clerk. Uh, first oath of office is for myself, the superintendent of schools, so I will invite at this time Gene Pangburn to come forward to uh, administer the oath of office to myself. We also uh, are swearing in a new um, slate of newly elected board members. And we have uh, Mr. Buno, Mr. Mann, and when Mrs. Curtin joins us, we'll swear in Mrs. Curtin. When Mrs. Curtin joins us, Jean will do that. Okay, we can take a pause and do that. The uh, next item on the agenda is the uh, policy number 2165, which is a school board member code of conduct. Uh, annually, uh, the superintendent and the board uh, review that code of conduct and sign uh, a document attesting to uh, that we will adhere to the policy. And I th believe that document has been distributed and uh, board members are encouraged to sign it during the meeting and Gene will pick it up at some point during the meeting. Okay. Next item is an agreement which is signed by administrators, board members, and all employees related to acceptable use of the district's technology. Uh, this is related to the board's uh, uh, operation and utilization of technology provided for the board in order to conduct board business. Uh, there is an agreement that is uh, on each of your tables and we would ask the board members to sign that agreement attesting that they have read the acceptable use agreement of the district related to its technology in, including its network. Here comes Mrs. Curtin. So we're going to take a pause for just a minute and we're going to allow Mrs. Skomersky and Mrs. Curtin to get settled and then we're going to ask that Mrs. Curtin 
take the oath of office as a newly elected board member, and we'll give Mrs. Skomersky a chance to settle, and then we'll let her sign the uh, code of conduct for board members in the acceptable use agreement. Perfect timing. <laughs> Very good. I want to thank each of our newly elected board members, Mr. Buno, Mr. Mann, and Mrs. Curtin for uh, agreeing to run for the board again and for continuing to serve our community and our school district. We appreciate all the time that our board members put in. We appreciate that uh, each of these longstanding board members have wanted to, uh, to take on the challenge again. It's much appreciated. Okay, at this time, uh, we will move to the election of nomination and election of the board president. Uh, I ask if there are any nominations for board president at this time. We'll take nominations. Okay, Mr. Mann, like to... okay, Mr. Mann has nominated Mike Buno. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, I believe that was Mr. Dunn uh, who seconded uh, the nomination for Mr. Buno. Are there any other nominations for board president at this time? Given that there are no other nominations, uh, I would ask the board to vote on the nomination of Michael Buno as our Board of Education President for the new term. Uh, and I'll call the vote. It could just be a simple yes, a voice vote. So all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, congratulations, Mr. Buno, on your reelection as the Board President. We Thank look forward much. to continuing to work with you in your leadership role on the board. And I appreciate the continued continuity of your leadership and supporting me and the administration as we continue to move our district forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate my colleagues uh, once again nominating me for the uh, board president role and uh, I'll fulfill my duties the best I can and continue to help uh, the district in the best of, in my best of my ability. So, the rest of it's yours, Mr. Bruno. Oh, my turn to take over. <laughs> um, we do the oaths afterwards or? Um, we the oaths? Oh, uh, yeah, I, th I think. Oh, we have, can we do the oath of the board president now? Thank you. Okay, the next uh, order of business is nominations for the vice president role. Do we hear any nominations from board members for vice president? Yes. I have a nomination for Mr. Mann. Second. Michelle, second. Any other nominations at all? Seeing none, uh, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor, Mr. Mann as vice president? All those opposed? None. Congratulations, Mr. Mann, on your election as vice president of the Supreme Board Central School District Board of Education. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our next uh, board officer role is assistant clerk, previously held by Karen Curran. Uh, do I have any nominations for assistant clerk? I nominate Miss Deanna Moop. Second. Second by Mr. Mann. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? None? Approved. Congratulations, Deanna. Thank, Thank you for you. Uh, stepping forward and uh, being an assistant clerk. <laughs> Thank you, Deanna. 
Uh, the next role of ward officers is deputy treasurer. I'll open the floor to nominations for deputy treasurer. Mark Mann, pointing to Mrs. Taylor. Joanne Taylor, do I second? Deanna, any other nominations? Seeing none, I uh, need a vote. All those in favor of Ms. Taylor as deputy treasurer? All those opposed? None. Congratulations, Ms. Taylor, for your, your role as deputy treasurer for the district. Okay. There's a lot of uh, our reorganization meeting. It has a lot of other appointments on it. So I'll continue through the agenda. The next one is the Board of Education appointments and stipends. Uh, there are several listed in the board uh, agenda, A through W. Is there any questions regarding any of those appointments um, and stipends as listed? Mr. Buno, I just want to make for a point for the public given the title Board of Education Appointments and Stipends. Yes. No board members receive stipends in the East Greenboro Central School District. Those are stipends that are contractual obligations of the district for various employees that are required for annual approval. Correct. The board stipend is about, it's about as low as it can get at zero. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the clarification, Mr. Simons. I know that uh, we really appreciate hearing that uh, compensation package that we had. That we're, members but yes these are the designated district offices and appointments uh, typically employees of the district and if there's an associated uh, monetary mm -hmm. stipend or hourly rate yes. they are listed in the attachment so any questions on those uh, this will be number five all the appointments listed in the board agenda yes a through w there's quite a quite a few here is there any changes or anything significant that we should be aware of well, there are no changes on this list uh, at this time. Okay. It's a standard list that is similar to last year's, identical to last year's. So this comparison is 1920 and 2021. Um, right. Similar number of positions in post time. I would note because the treasurer's position isn't filled that Linda Wager is still serving in a transitional role as the treasurer. Okay. Uh, and um, the only other thing I would point out is the Section 504 compliance officer is Molly McGrath. And um, don't believe there are any other changes as of last year. Okay. Gene Pagburn is the district clerk. Yes. Correct. Okay. Any questions, Mark? Anything that goes on? Okay. If there's uh, no questions, I need a, uh, a motion to approve the list of Board of Education appointments and stipends. Deanna, second. Kathleen, all those in favor? Approved. Next one is the employment of impartial hearing officers for Committee on Special Education. This is a list of hearing officers should we need to have an impartial hearing. It's a list provided by the uh, New York State Education Department. That's right. And it's a list that uh, we need to approve in case there is any kind of impartial hearings. Any questions on that item? Seeing none, I need a motion to approve that. Kathleen, second. Joanne? All those in favor? Approved. Uh, number seven, we're going to pull for other considerations. Yes. Um, <coughs> we need to make some contacts on the committee membership. Okay. Mrs. Taylor, thank you for bringing that point up. I appreciated that. Thank you. I spoke to uh, Ms. McGrath today, and she is right on top of that. I appreciate her time with that. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Um, next one, number eight, appointment of election workers for district votes. Any questions or comments? Obviously, depending on the nature of the election, as we experienced this year, we may not need all these folks, but uh, we want to have a, a good list and alternates for um, the election works. So. There's no questions. I need a uh, motion to approve that. Michelle, second. Kathleen, all those in favor? Approved. I don't mean to ignore you, John. It's hard to see you from way over here, so just... <laughs> All right, next we have our designations list. These are designations for the district 
repository of district funds, district newspapers, the Board of Ed meetings, penalty schedule for 2020, 2021, mileage rates, reimbursements, prices for school meals and athletic admission rates. I don't believe there was um, many changes there. Mr. Simons? No. Any questions or comments on those items? No. If not, I need a motion to approve that. Joanne, second. Michelle, all those in favor? Approved. Going to authorizations, we have several items here, A through M. Anything of significance during the authorizations? They should be pretty. No, they're all standard. Standard? Okay. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, I need a motion to approve the designations. Kathleen, second. Deanna, all those in favor? Peter, we lost the screen. We have there. I see you looking. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm assuming John voted yes on that because I can't see him behind the screen. Yep, I see a thumb. The thumbs up. There it is. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, we're now moving to the adoption of the policy manual. Any comments, Mr. Simons, on that? Uh, no comments on the uh, policies. These are policies related to investments, purchasing, and parental involvement that are required for annual approval. So, if it's okay with the board, can we take 11 A and B together for consent? Oh, excuse um, me. I, th I mentioned B. I was, you were referring to A. I, I was ahead of you one step. Okay. So. It's annual adoption of the entire policy manual. Okay. I stand corrected. So we'll take 11 A and B together. All those in, uh, need a motion to approve that. Mr. Mann, second. Michelle, all those in favor? Approved, 11 A and B. Medicaid compliance program for 2020. I'm thinking Molly will do a presentation for us at some point on Medicaid yes. compliance. There's an annual training requirement for the board that usually typically occurs in the fall. Okay. So this just approves the program at this point and then we'll have our training at, at a future date. Yes. Okay. Any questions or comments on the Medicaid compliance program? All right, need a motion to approve that. Joanne, second Kathleen, all those in favor? None opposed, approved. Number 13, procedures for post issuance compliance with federal tax law. Uh, any explanation needed for that? that I think Simons? I'm going to Linda? see if Mrs. Wager is uh, able to explain that right now. I'm <laughs> sure she is. Or, does, or she can steer it right to Mr. Edson. Caught you off guard. I, okay. I like to, used to like to do that to Larry, so I decided. <laughs> <laughs> borrowing money, there's a certain you know, earning percentages on it, or earning interest on it, we have to use that money within a certain amount of time in order to use interest on it. Very good. Perfect. Yeah. 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 In some status. Okay. Good. Very good, you said in seven pages uh, worth of stuff in just a few <laughs> sentences, I appreciate that. So um, if there's no questions or comments, you need a motion to approve that uh, procedures. Deanna, second. Joanne, all those in favor? Unanimous, approved. Uh, interscholastic athletic rates, uh, I looked at these, these are the same rates as yes. uh, last year. Any questions or comments on the rates? Seeing none, I need a motion to approve that. Kathleen, second, Michelle. All those in favor? Approved. The board member addresses. Any questions on those? Anybody's address incorrect? We're good? Okay. We have to approve our own addresses? Is that what we have to do? Uh, just verify that they are accurate. Okay. <laughs> it does say we have. Uh, resolution to approve it. So I guess we're going to approve our motion to approve our addresses. Uh, I need a motion. Kathleen, second. Michelle, all those in favor. Those are approved as well. Okay. And board member committees. So we sent out an email and everyone pretty much stayed in the same 
uh, committees. There was a couple changes, I believe. And then uh, yes. any questions on that list? Are they accurate? We capture everybody. I am now the liaison to the GCC. That's correct. Congratulations. That Thank you. <laughs> and um, other than that, any, any questions on the committees? We're good. All right. Need a motion to approve the board committees. Joanne, second. Michelle, all those in favor? Approved. Whew. Okay. The organization meeting is uh, now uh, closed. I need a motion to adjourn the organization meeting. Kathleen, I need a second. Deanna, all those in favor? All right. The organization is now complete and adjourn the, uh, that meeting. Congratulations to all board officers and newly elected board members. Thank you for presiding, Mr. Simons. I appreciate it. Um, we will now move to our next agenda item. We will go to the public hearing on ESSA, Consolidated Grant and Title I Parent and the Family Engagement. We will uh, call the meeting to order at 725. Roll call, we have everyone present except for Ms. Massey, I don't believe she is on yet. Peter, can you tell if she's on at all? I don't believe she's present at this point, but okay. So same board members present uh, with the exception of Ms. Massey. I will then uh, turn it over to Mr. McHugh to for the public hearing. So part of the regulations are that we have to have an annual public hearing on the development of our consolidated application for ESSA funded programs. And uh, just real briefly, Title I's federal funding. It's been around since 1965. And really, it's distributed to schools according to the percentage of students that are on free and reduced lunch. Uh, and the goal of that is to assure that there are supplemental supports and services for students that are identified as uh, economically disadvantaged or free and reduced lunch. Um, and really, the theory behind that is that there's a greater risk of failure. Uh, Peter, I don't even think that's worth. Uh, Title I funds are used to upgrade the entire educational program in a school, uh, and all students are eligible to benefit from the Title I Part A funds. We use our Title I Part A funds for academic intervention services, uh, academic support for at-risk students, and all local educational agencies receive Title I Part A funds. Uh, part of that funding last year, we were required to do a minimum of $3,900 for uh, homeless students, and I'll talk about that briefly. Peter, can you just move it? Uh, keep going. Yeah. yeah. Probably not getting it from here. You, can, you, can you keep going? Keep going. Perfect. Uh, so our Title I Part A funds, we use it to uh, support our remedial uh, program, academic intervention services. And how we use our funding is we have 2.6 FTEs at Donald P. Sutherland, 2.5 at Red Mill, and we also provide a 0.2 uh, full-time employee for Hol Holy Spirit, um, and then the required homeless reserve. So our total last year was $319,844. Our preliminary allocation for this year is $347,819. And basically that is based on the child counts in poverty, the neglected care institutions and foster care. That comes right off of your beds data in October when that's uploaded. Next slide, Peter. Uh, how we identify eligible buildings. And this is really important because when you look at our poverty rate, our free and reduced percentages by building, we're starting to get pretty close. So we're, what's important is that we're identified as an average needs district with high perform, that's high performing. So all seven of our schools are schools in good standing. Uh, New York State targeted threshold for economically disadvantaged is 40%, and we're not hitting that 
mark. So uh, 2018 and 19, we were 23%. Last year, we were 24%. So um, we see a gradual increase, but not a significant increase. Here, we will decide. Oh, okay, sorry. So Donald P. Sutherland and Red Miller both identified by us, and it's important that folks know that we identify those buildings. We have, we, we have an allocation and we're able to identify whichever buildings uh, we feel are appropriate to identify as Title I schools. So, um, and that is based on the percentage of students that are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Uh, the poverty rate for our schools, which we identified as Title I schools, Donald P. Sutherland, uh, this past school year was 39%. Red Mill was 28%. Next slide, Peter. If you notice, though, uh, Janae is right behind at 27%. Goff, 25.54%. Columbia High School, 20%. Green Meadow, 17%. And Belltop, 17%. Uh, next slide, Peter. So there are some rules, and people say, you know, why don't we identify additional schools as Title I because there's only a percentage difference between Red Mill and Janae based on last year's percentages. And um, what's important to understand is we don't get an increase in our allocation by identifying more schools. So the allocation is the allocation. Um, the methodology of how we use those monies needs to be, stay consistent. And the way we use that is that we use that to um, cover our remedial program. So for students that um, that qualify for academic intervention services, that's our methodology of using Title I funds. So our allocation that we get through Title I doesn't even cover both of those buildings. So we start out with our most, our highest free and reduced percentage, which is Donald P. Sutherland. We cover our remedial teachers at Donald P. Sutherland. And then we move to our next highest free and reduced percentage, which is Red Mill and the money runs out. So we, we can't even cover um, those teachers. So there is no real advantage for identifying an additional building as a Title I school. Uh, next slide, Peter. Utilization of funding. It's also important to know that, uh, you know, that we have uh, supported our students in need of academic supports and services. It's reviewed by our data team, our instructional support teams in each building but our students are provided the services and supports in all of our schools based on their academic need and not poverty. So we're not just hitting the minimum. The, our, our students, if they qualify for those services, they receive those services. Uh, what's also important to point out is it was one of the goals uh, set by the board is that each of the seven buildings established the data team this year and reviewed our student academic data regularly and made instructional decisions based on that data. Part of it is the universal screening. Uh, and this is really important. Part of the requirement is that you're using multiple measures, standards-based assessment, or, or I'm, I'm sorry, uh, research-based assessment tools to determine whether or not a child qualifies for AIS. And we have consistency in all of our buildings, but what's really important is that we have consistency in our five elementary buildings. So what really uh, could have happened and did occur to some degree is a student in one of our five elementary buildings may qualify for AIS in that building, but if that student went to another one of our elementary buildings, that student may have not qualified for academic intervention services. That problem is resolved. All of our students take consistent universal screeners during the same time period, and based on those cut scores, that determines whether or not the student receives that academic intervention uh, services, those supports. In K2, we use DIBBLES, Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills. Grades two through five, we use our CARS assessment, Comprehensive Assessment of Reading Strategies. And K5 throughout, use Fontas and Pinnell. Uh, we had an updated screening planned in May this year that was to occur for Fontas and Pinnell. That was canceled. Uh, we're going to do it in September. Uh, and because there's so much uncertainty, even in September, we're going to do it webinar based. So uh, teachers can report to their classrooms, log on to the computer and receive that updated training. Um, next slide, Peter. Uh, in regards to academic intervention services, that's additional instructional support. It means extra time focused instruction 
uh, increased student teacher instructional contact time, and it occurs outside of the ELA block. So it's in addition to, it's not in replace of. So students that uh, qualify for that support, those supports are provided outside of that 90 minute block. So all the students get that 90 minute uninterrupted block in, the, in our K-5 setting, and then they get an additional dose of support of English language arts outside of that block. It varies in, uh, in how that service is delivered. Sometimes the, the remedial teacher pushes in to the classroom. Other times those students come out of the classroom. And basically um, the intensity and the duration of that service is very student dependent. So whatever the student needs. So it could be an intervention that the student receives three times a week for 20 minutes. If the student's not showing progress and not showing growth, then that can be modified. The student could receive that support daily uh, and the time could change. It could be 20 minutes daily. It could change to a 40 minute daily. It's really what that student needs. Uh, progress monitoring is typically conducted every four to six weeks. It's given to any students who's identified at risk for not achieving grade level expectations. That's really important because if it's not working and it's not documented based on the data, then that intervention needs to change. Uh, and then that process could occur multiple times prior to a student being referred to a committee on special education. Uh, next slide, Peter. Thanks. Uh, state monitor student performance and state assessments uh, with attention to subgroup achievement. Uh, students enrolled in buildings with higher poverty rates are considered at risk for uh, having difficulty meeting the academic standards. But the important part is that we are held accountable on all subgroups, so ethnicity, race, poverty, second language status, all irrelevant. We're responsible to make sure that those children are progressing and showing growth and achievement. Um, all seven schools, again, this year were schools in good standing. Both Columbia and high school, both Columbia High School and Red Mill uh, were identified as recognition schools. Districts in New York State are required to calculate the eligibility for supplemental academical, academic support using multiple measures and we talked about that, but we had two schools identified as recognition schools and that's because of either a quick growth, but it's also growth in all subgroups. So um, there's not a significant difference between any subgroup. So your all students are performing just as well as your students that may be identified as economically disadvantaged um, or any ethnic, ethnic uh, group or race. So they're all performing uh, similar. The next page, uh, our building principals have done this for the last two years. They do a self-assessment and uh, they answer these questions. So there's a lot of individual time and thought put into it by each building principal and our building principals also collaborate and come together to answer these questions. So uh, things that they're really discussing are, did the results surprise you? Uh, were you aware that the subgroup performance on this indicator was either low or not improving? improving? Uh, they reviewed the desegregated data. Uh, were they aware that these students were part of that subgroup? Were they aware that the students were having difficulty? Uh, and then they look at it. Is the issue really isolated to this subgroup or is it an early warning uh, of a problem that may, may be more symptomatic in nature? And I'll, I'll give you an example of that. Um, you know, for years I've listened to Mrs. Taylor talk about school attendance and the importance of school attendance. <laughs> A lot of times we connect our students that are struggling and we look at that attendance record and the attendance is an issue. Uh, so it's directly le linked to student achievement. Uh, you know, is the identification of a level one indicative of previous trends? Uh, is it a single year's worth of data? Is it ongoing? Has it been the same issue two or three years in a row? And then next slide, just to give you a quick little snapshot of our buildings, uh, Belltop's ESSA accountability. So, um, Anytime you have a level one indicator, you have to file in an addendum through uh, the SED portal. So um, you're really shooting for level threes and level fours. Belltop Elementary School, you'll see a lot there for a level one indicator for students with disabilities. What's really important is that the number of students, first of all, Belltop has a low overall enrollment. It has very few students with an IEP, students with disability. So when, when a student does not perform well on that state assessment, that impacts that overall score much more than it would with a school with a higher number of students in that subgroup. Okay, so 
For example, Belltop has a self-contained classroom, um, you know, and those students struggle academically for a variety of reasons. Um, but there, if, if four or five students in, in that self-contained classroom uh, can't pass that New York State test, then it impacts our ESSA accountability report. Next slide. Long Beach Sutherland had no level one indicators last year. This year they had chronic absenteeism and they break it right down for your subgroup. So it's for white students, chronic absenteeism. And uh, Mr. Alvey has been working at that quite a bit. Um, you know, a lot of conversations with parents. Um, next slide, Janae Elementary. Uh, math academic progress for Asian students, chronic absenteeism for economically disadvantaged students. So, you know, you have, um, you know, those things tied together. You, that's an often common finding that, you know, when you look at chronic absenteeism and you know, look who the students are, a lot of times those students fall into that category of economically disadvantaged. So, um, you know, that's that also that uh, support services that we plug in, our school social workers, our guidance counselors, uh, also working on that. Um, the other part is for math academic progress for Asian students, it's just important to be mindful that, Janae is our ENL cluster school. So all of our schools that do not speak English as their first language um, are at Janae Elementary. Next slide. Green Meadow, uh, level one indicators were student growth for economically disadvantaged students, Hispanic students, and white students. Uh, what's really important is that those same subgroups that were identified as a level one in not showing enough growth, and the state sense, sets that mark, they were a level four in student achievement. So that's as high as you can go. Level four is the highest level of achievement. So uh, Green Meadow had three subgroups that were identified as a level one for not making enough progress, enough growth, but they were a level four in achievement. Uh, the other part is when, it, when you look at the subgroup of um, chronic absenteeism for Asian students, we're talking about three students. So in previous years, you had to have 30 students in a subgroup in order to be um, in order to be a group that you were accountable for. Now it's irrelevant how many students are in there. So uh, this particular case, you're, you're looking at three students. And it is a challenge sometimes about um, when some of these families return home. They return home sometimes for uh, in excess of a month and then uh, come back to us. So. Um, you know, that's a tough one uh, to fix. Next slide. Red Mill, uh, student growth, students with disabilities, same situation as Green Meadow. So they're a level one as far as not showing enough growth. But what's remarkable is the subgroup of students with disabilities at Red Mill is a level four in student achievement. So it's like being at the top rung of the ladder and there's nowhere else to go. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. Next slide. Goff Middle School uh, for accountability, level one indicators, none, uh, which should be applauded. But taking a look back to 2017 and 2018, you can see their level one indicators, chronic absenteeism, academic progress, ELA and math, uh, average ELA and math, academic progress. And, um, you know, Mr. Grignan was aware of this and uh, worked hard to come up with a plan to remediate those things and worked hard with his faculty and staff. And uh, this, this year, zero level one indicator, so none. So uh, Goff Middle School did a great job. And our, our last building, Columbia High School, level one indicators, chronic absenteeism. And it's the subgroups of white students, economically disadvantaged students, and Asian students. It's something that we've been working hard to combat, but it, again, um, it is something that we've been identified as a level one indicator for chronic absenteeism. The other one, number two, it's not quite an accountability yet, but it's coming and there's a lot of discussion about it, is our six year graduation rate. And if you see that subgroup, it's, it is also for our economically disadvantaged students. So, um, you know, in the past when these students didn't graduate, uh, you know, you may try to stay in contact with them and see if you could get them to graduate either in August or the following year, maybe mid-year. Uh, you're now accountable for six years. So um, it's important that everyone understands that. And it's important to understand that we need to stay in contact with these students that may not 
graduate in the normal four-year high school experience and uh, not not give up on them and stay on them be, uh, for the next few years because uh, we are accountable for them at year five and we're now going to be accountable for those students in year six. Next slide, Peter. Some required assurances, it's section 8306 of the ESSA, uh, you know, consultations. So uh, that's what's occurring right now. Um, I was responsible to reach out to 22 schools um, and those schools, two of them are located within our district, uh, Woodland Hills and Holy Spirit, uh, but we have uh, 22 additional schools where our students um, that live in the district may attend. And those schools could uh, include Albany Academy, LaSalle, Emma Willard, but they also uh, include some of the schools located in Albany. And it's our responsibility to reach out to those schools, to have planning meetings and discussions to see if some of those students would qualify for Title one monies and that's based on where those students reside so they would need to live in the attendance zone of red mill or donald p sutherland to be eligible and then on that private school they would have to show a demonstrated need that the student needed that academic support um, so it is our uh district it is our uh local educational agency our lead um, that we are determining the per pupil uh, amounts and we get our overall district uh, allotment and then um, I fill out those grants. Uh, <laughs> and, and so it's, it's, uh, it's the summer ritual. And so that includes Title I, Title II, Title III. And a few years ago, we did qualify for Title IIA, which was uh, immigrant education. And we, um, we provided a summer program using that allocation. And what's been around for the last couple of years is Title IV. What you do see with all of the money is that uh, when we went back to those previous slides and we showed those level one indicators that these monies really have to be utilized to remediate those level one indicators. So uh, they've really tightened up on what's allowable and what's not allowable. Um, and it really has to be tied to those level one indicators. So typical year, June, July, allocations are typically announced. The only one they have announced so far is Title I Part A. We're waiting on uh, the other title grants. Uh, on May 22nd, mailed out 22 letters uh, to ascertain intent to participate and verify poverty data information. Uh, and then I usually uh, make some phone calls, send additional emails, and I've been known to go visit and knock on doors. Um, to, to get that paperwork. Uh, in June and July, uh, we have a lot of in-person visits and requesting responses. And I spend a lot of time and I've, uh, we've been audited twice in uh, the last three years. Uh, and I had an opportunity to um, express some of my concerns. Uh, some of my concerns are that SED comes right over the bridge, over the river. And it's very convenient to come audit us. Uh, that's, that's one of them. Uh, but we also spend a lot of time educating the private schools. They really don't understand uh, how they qualify for those monies and how they can utilize those monies. So we are responsible. So um, even though uh, they may be entitled to some level or Title I monies, we're responsible on how they spend it. So they may call us up and request something that's not an allowable expense. And we spend a lot of time um, explaining <laughs> that. Educating. Yes, yes we do. Uh, the, the grants are all due uh, in August and um, we usually hear back from them fairly soon. Um, last part. Uh, school parent con uh, compact, so each Title I school, Donald P. Sutherland and the Red Mill, has to have in place a school parent compact, and it really just outlines the responsibilities um, for, each, for each group, the student, the parent, and uh, the school, the faculty, and staff. Next page, Peter. Uh, you know, for ex just real quick, these are the responsibilities of the school, providing a high-quality curriculum and instruction, to hold parent-teacher conferences, frequent reports on the child's progress, um, reasonable access to staff, and providing opportunities for parents to volunteer and participate. Um, and 
the big thing is that these things need to be done in a language that the parents and family members can understand. So uh, we do a lot of translation of documents. Um, we have, I believe, 20, 26 different languages that are spoken in the district. So when something goes home that is significant and relevant, we have to make sure that it's translated in that uh, language. Parents' uh, responsibility is, um, you know, making sure that the child gets to school, completing the homework. Uh, we ask them to volunteer and participate um, in decisions that impact their child's education and to promote positive use of their child's extracurricular time and the parent responsibility to stay informed. So the things that come crumbled up in the bottom of the backpack, it's important that they pull it out and uh, read it. Student responsibilities, doing homework every day, asking for help, reading at least 20 minutes a day outside of school, and to give their parents all the notices and information that they receive from school. Uh, we have a parent uh, and family engagement. This was a result of our last desk audit that occurred two years ago, and Mr. Edson um, put this uh, policy together for parent and family engagement. It's policy 1900. There is also 1900 E1 uh, that goes with that, encouraging parents to stay involved. And uh, last but not least, Peter, is the parents' uh, rights under Title I. So it's, this, is, this information is on our webpage. It is also included in the letter that goes home to all students that receive academic intervention services. But uh, basically, it is um, informing parents that um, there is an a, a protocol in place where uh, if a parent feels that their child is not getting what they are entitled to and what they deserve, that the parents uh, have a right um, to file a complaint. And these are the steps that must be taken. So this information is available on the web page. And again, it's uh, included in the letters that are required to go home once a child um, qualifies for academic intervention <laughs> services. So that was a lot of information. Any questions or comments? Yeah, we uh, at this point, we have um, two sections, really the public comment period for the public hearing, which is kind of difficult given the circumstances. Um, but we do have the email if people want to, are watching and want to make a comment, they can email uh, into the uh, email system that's posted. But also, at the same time, is there any comments, questions, general, from the board members, including Mr. Dunn? I don't see you yet, but uh, if you have anything, you can uh, certainly speak up. I just want to thank the comments. Thank you for all your work. Hey, Mike, give a comment. Go ahead, John. All right. Uh, Jim, that was a great presentation. I appreciate the effort, especially with uh, what's going on. Do you anticipate any changes or because we've been shut down a little bit, an increase in some of the demands in this area when we get back in the fall or what are your thoughts on that? Just very briefly. Uh, you know, I think the remediation, the academic intervention support, uh, we may see an uptick in the number of students that qualify. Um, you know, there's a typical, um, a little bit of a loss uh, over the summer months and um, with us being remote for so long, we do anticipate to see um, probably more students qualify for that service. Um, in regards to other things that could be supported through some of our title grants, we do have Title IV monies that um, can be used to support uh, students. Um, I think that those um, support services are probably going to be needed more than ever uh, next year. Um, you know, we talk a, a lot lately about uh, social distancing, and um, a lot of people are starting to use the term physical difference, distancing rather than social distancing because, you know, there's a need for our students to socialize and interact with each other. It's something that they've been missing for several months. So, um, you know, I, I would anticipate that, um, you know, our students, if we're in person uh, or we're hybrid, that, um, you know, making those strong connections with our kids are going to be absolutely important. But I, I do anticipate a little bit of a, a dip. We might see an uptick in our number of students that qualify for yeah. uh, academic support. Yep. 
good question, John. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments for uh, Mr. McHugh? Again, appreciate all the work, Jim. We know how much that, that goes into this. I think one thing too is about the use of the data under SI. I know that even if it's challenging with the, uh, the group sizing being much smaller, it does really target a district like ours that has a lot of high performing um, or people are meeting standard, kids meeting standard. But sometimes when those level one students were missing because they weren't enough big enough subgroup, mm -hmm. but now we really know how we can help those students to achieve better and understand that, you know, for example, the level four on one and level one on absenteeism, you know, it's like, how much more can you do with that? Mm -hmm. So we understand, you know, some of those oddball things that are happening. But I think it does help to uh, identify those areas and those students where we, we can uh, provide some more assistance. I, you know, I, I just want to stress the fact that our, our principals have embraced it. Yeah. Um, you know, they reach out to Todd Witherall mm -hmm. in our data department and request reports now that probably they never thought to um, request. So Mr. Garib's got quite a system in place at Green Meadow to call up that data and look at it and actually act upon that data. So it's, it's going on in all of our buildings. Great. And, our buildings have started that those data teams in all of the buildings, and that was a, a growing experience. It was something different with a different approach to it. But yeah, and as we uh, as our principals do that, they work with their staff, and then the teachers can modify their instruction to to better fit the students' needs. So good to hear. So good luck with the extra money, and hopefully uh, we get with a few extra bucks in there, right? Yeah, there is <laughs> a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. Any public comments, Mr. Simons? Uh, let me just refresh. There are no emails at this time. Would you accept comments after the sure. public email hearing? Sure. Okay. I'll respond. Okay. Any other uh, board member comments? If not, we can um, close the public hearing. Need a motion to close public hearing. Joanne, second. Michelle, all those in favor? All right. The public hearing is closed. We'll now move to our third meeting of the night, the regular meeting. Peter, can you bring up uh, our audience if they're available? I uh, see a blue screen. They must have lost them. So I'll, I'll call the meeting to order 756 by my laptop. Attendance is still the same. Uh, Ms. Massey may or may not join us depending on her work commitment. I'm here. I'm here. Oh, welcome, Ms. Massey. Thank you. No, I joined at 7.54 p.m. Perfect. 7.54, we have that. Good. Uh, we did uh, the Pledge of Allegiance earlier. Yes. Okay, so we will move to the next section. I don't think we have any student council at this point. Since they have graduated, I'm one of them anyway. Uh, public forum. Again, a reminder that if there's any public comments, um, to please utilize the email section. Residents, students, employees, and business representatives of the East Greenwood Central School District may address the board on matters concerning programs and or operations of the district other than matters involving personnel. <clears throat> Members of the board do not, do not directly respond to citizen concerns during the public forum. If a response is appropriate, either the president or superintendent will contact the individual in the near future. Those persons wishing to address the board will be recognized by the chair of the meeting and should state for the record their name and address or affiliation with the district or business. While the board does not wish to infringe upon free speech protections, it must be stressed that the visitor's forum is not deemed to be an open forum. The board president will conduct the forum for the orderly and efficient operation of board business. In addition, any remarks which may be considered defamatory or stigmatizing or prohibited will be declared out of order. All comments will be received by email. Yes. So we will open that up. If there's any comments from the email or from our audience, I, thought, I think I saw a few administration folks in there. If there's any comments. We can't see you, but I think we can hear you. All right. Hearing none, we will move to the board form and superintendent report if we do get an email. Mm -hmm. Let me know, Mr. Yes. So we will start with Michelle. She's good. Mark, you're good. Deanna, I'm good. Thank good. You. Kathleen, good. Joanne, I'm all set. you're all set. Mr. Dunn, or 
Ms. Massey, Jennifer? Peter, did we lose everybody? There yeah, they are. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. John, you're good? <laughs> Jennifer, you're good? I just had a couple things I wanted to say. I think I wrote them down here. I'll put my paper. Um, I just want to commend the district for the um, Min Mali for the great start for the ESY. Uh, it sounds like from the pictures and from what we've observed that it was an excellent. Any comments, Molly, about that? About ESY? Sorry, I was just trying to unmute. It was a very smooth start. Um, I couldn't be happier with all the planning and preparation and hard work. It, it really went well. The students um, arrived and got into the building quickly. They kept their space. About 80% of students were wearing masks, so we were very happy to see that. And um, dismissal went just as smoothly. Day two, we shaved off 10 minutes on both arrival and dismissal. So shout out to Mark Noeth and his team. They were, they were awesome. Great. Thanks, Molly. And I really appreciate all the work that went into that preparation. And let's hope for a smooth summer, um, as well as the opening and get the kinks out and yep. keep rolling. So thank you very much, team. Thank you. All right. Uh, the other thing is graduation. Just want to give kudos to the administrative staff, Mr. Harkin, uh, our custodial staff, everyone who helped make that event a, uh, a success. Long day. We postponed it. Time has made the right call on the weather, and uh, we got through it. And I think it was just terrific. I remember seeing Jeannie there, and uh, some other folks were recognized. And I'm just uh, proud to be there, proud to be part of this district, and celebrate our students in the way we could. Just a few, obviously, too. Um, and just uh, seeing the uh, ability for the students and parents to engage, receive their diplomas, get some pictures, just uh, was great. So, again, thanks to everyone who made that event possible. And with that, any other comments? Final comments? No. Nope. Okay. We'll now move to discussion items, Mr. Simon, the district-wide safety plan. Uh, yes, I believe Mr. Tooker is with us uh, remotely. Mr. Tooker, are you out there? I am here. Okay, very good. Jeff Tooker uh, has updated our district-wide safety plan for submission to the State Education Department. Uh, the document is available for the board's review tonight. I'll ask the board to do a preliminary approval, but there is a requirement for a 30-day public comment period. Uh, if we don't receive comments tonight, any comments that we do receive via email to the district, I will make the board and Mr. Tooker aware of those comments. There would be an opportunity to revise the plan should the board feel it would need to be revised based on any comment between now and the August 19th meeting. Last year, you may recall that there was guidance that came from the State Education Department that district-wide safety plans needed to include an attachment of the school resource officer agreements. In the case of the uh, both the East Greenbush uh, Police Department, the Town of East Greenbush and Rensselaer County Sheriff's Department, we have indicated our intent to uh, continue the arrangement for both the resource officer high school, which is through East Greenbush and the Sheriff's Office uh, through the Deputy Sheriff Jeff Russo at Goff uh, Middle School. The changes to the plan are minor this year. Uh, they require a um, identification of a chief emergency officer. That would be me. And there is a pandemic uh, mass illness category now. And I'll ask them to defer to Mr. Tooker as to whether we have any more information on what might need to be updated regarding that new category of emergency. As with everything else, we are awaiting New York State education guidance <laughs> on that. That's what, there's been nothing, we have a, our mass illness goes to Rensselaer County Department of Health right now. That's the current policy that we have for mass illness. If we take it a step further, because the state has come in and given guidelines that have superseded the county, we would have to kind of defer to the state if they come out with something. Good. Right. Mr. Tricker, are there any other changes or any other requirements that you want to talk about at this time? No, the only one is on page four, and you don't have to go to it's page four, the bottom bullet under implementation of school security. I know uh, Mr. McHugh had reached out to me. We're going to have a conversation at the end of the month about the uh, locked single point of entry 
for where we enter in the morning. I know that's part of our discussions about reopening. We may have to just revise that a little bit and have multiple points of entry that are monitored. I know we've been talking about that. We're going to have a conversation at the end of the month. That's the only change that would be made if we had to on August 19th. Okay. Very good. Thank you, Jeff. Does the board member, do the board members have any questions regarding the safety plan? Oh, based, based on events we have, when there is an event, we have at times hired them and, but not, not typically. And we did create an evening, we created an evening position at the high school, but we did not have a weekend. Uh, yeah, should it be changed? Yeah. Yeah. Jeff, I'm going to ask for your input on that. The question was, it says that we, on the bottom of page four, that we include, we employ security personnel on the weekends. Should we revise that and say, uh, uh, in, in the event of uh, uh, district events? Because we don't, we don't have people there. Yes, yes, we can do Saturday that. Saturday and Sunday, if there's nothing going on. We can do that. Now, I, I couldn't hear who asked the question about that, which, uh, who asked that? Was that Mr. Mann? It's Mr. Mann. They uh, he, he, you know, relay. I know, uh, Mark, you can hear me. Um, we can um, put in there as well uh, at the police department. The cameras are monitored. We are going to add that in there now at the communication center that we actually have a camera on each front door. I was going to add that in. I didn't add it for this because sometimes it's hit and miss, but um, we could strike where it says and on weekends. We could say school days and evenings, and we could say that East Greenwich PD does monitor it all weekend. So I remember I, I said when I worked there, I watched them. They are there are people there in and out. We actually have had some issues where we've sent law enforcement to the buildings, not even in our town. We've sent them up there to, to DPS. There's been cars sitting in the front and they've gone and checked it out. So that's a good thing. So we'll add that in there. We'll we'll strike where it says on weekends and we'll add in that they're monitored. Cameras are monitored. That's good. Thank you, Mark. Very good. Any other board member comments? Okay. Anything else from Jeff? Uh, Mr. Tucker, do you have anything else to add? I just thank you for the support on this, and we'll reconvene. What's it, August? I believe it's 19th. It'll be adopted because remember, the adopted date has to be on or before September 1st. So the official adoption date will be the 19th. And we were, we've been uh, uh, communi in communication with both the town and the sheriff's department. The sheriff's department agreement just needed a commitment from us. It is renewable. Mm -hmm. it's, it's renewable on an annual basis or with 30 days notice, but it, w it extends out to 2023, the actual mm -hmm. agreement. So that is on there. The East Greenbush agreement is a year to year thing. And they've, they've indicated that they will update that and get it to us within the week. Great. Yeah. If that can just, as soon as it gets on there, we can just uh, have Mr. Adam make a blurb on the website, say it's, it's now there. I honestly don't know how many people look at it. I, I know I do, but I don't know how many people look at it, but it's that requirement. So okay. Very good. have it on there. It'll be good. Thanks Jeff. No problem. You're welcome to stay for the remainder of the meeting. That's your choice. Uh, but, uh, you're welcome to I, attend other matters. It's it's got me out of doing the drill at the firehouse. That I'm sure they're all hot. <laughs> so, so I will gladly stay on. Okay, very good. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Tucker. <clears throat> so, in regards to plan, we have a preliminary approval. Then we have modifications. Yes, on the consent agenda, there's a preliminary approval, and I I made sure that the resolution on the on the page says it's preliminary okay and subject to further revisions and uh, final adoption on the 19th great okay all right now moving on to our committee reports marissa none of this time linda any reports committee reports okay thank you on June 11th, the uh, <clears throat> Finance and Audit Committee met and we discussed the status of the internal audits and the annual external audit. Michael Wolf, our internal auditor, explained to us that in light of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, his work on the internal audits for risk assessment and payroll, which were scheduled in March, had to be postponed. He has since uh, sent us, made a selection, has sent the selection to us 
we've started to pull it. And he will, when we have the documents ready, he'll pick them up and he assures us he'll return them within four days because we'll need those for the Bonadio audit, which takes place in August. Uh, Mr. Wolf also explained that over the summertime, he is going to conduct the audit for the extra classroom. He's going to finish up the 2018-19 Education Foundation, and he's, always, he's also going to take a look at the separation payments. Uh, as far as the external audit goes, uh, Ms. Fitzik, who is the manager from Bonadio, will be the manager uh, conducting our audit this year. She presented a PowerPoint presentation uh, describing the process of the audit. We talked about the scope of the audit, uh, as well as the auditor responsibilities, our management responsibilities, and governance responsibilities. We talked about the types of audit risk and their approach to the audit, how they plan the audit, uh, the source data that they'll be taking a look at, how they risk uh, a risk assessment, how they execute the audit and report and review with management. They'll also be looking, um, doing a single audit, which is in conformance with uniform guidance, and that is where they look at our federal funds, and they will select one major program to audit and look at. They consider fraud, and uh, we reviewed the timetable. So we did preliminary work in May in which they covered cash receipts, cash disbursements, payroll, and extra classroom. And the final week of audit will be the week of August 10th. And we talked about new developments. We talked about how COVID-19 has affected us this year. Uh, we also talked about the implementation of GASB 84, which has to do with fiduciary activities. And we will be responsible for reporting that uh, for the year end June 30th, 2021. And they also provided us with their service team contacts. They provided the committee with the contacts. Um, other than that, are there any questions? I don't think so. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Moving to uh, our next committee reports. Jim, anything? Not unless you want me to do the public hearing. <laughs> <laughs> sure. um, Jeff? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I want to report on our second uh, reopening task force meeting, which was held on June 29th. Uh, we had a lot of uh, content to cover, including committee reports from each of the subcommittee chairs on those committees had met between our first meeting and our last meeting of the 29th. Mr. McHugh reported on the discussions of the ENL bilingual committee. Uh, we had a report from Mrs. Wagger regarding the uh, budgetary considerations. Interestingly, uh, as has been pointed out, the impact of the COVID-19 costs, uh, we're tracking that uh, diligently uh, and but still have somewhat of an ambigu ambiguity regarding the guidelines as to what might be reimbursable through FEMA. However, we are tracking it and anticipating both um, some of the expenses that we've had this year and how we might resolve some of those expenses, but also as we move into the uncertainty of next year, I think Mrs. Wagger has recommended wisely to really monitor fund balance and, and make sure that we are um, knowing where we could spend additional money should some emergency needs uh, Come about. So we appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Goodwin is developing a survey to uh, align with what the state is asking us to do. Uh, this year, the state asked us to update our plans during the school shutdown to try to do our best to estimate the connectivity issues that some of our families might be challenged by, whether they have devices, whether they have internet access. And we did our best to do an estimate based on what we know about our kids and families and the distribution of our technology. However, um, in anticipation of further issues that we might need to address in the reopening, Mr. Goodwin is developing a survey that will focus on technology and the availability of technology. We'll need that in the event that we do remote learning 
uh, again in the fall or will you do a hybrid? So uh, Mr. Goodwin is gonna be issuing that survey from the district very, very soon. Uh, additionally, uh, Ms. Cannon, Mr. Cannon has been working with uh, procedures and protocols for employee safety, as well as uh, appropriate signage, ordering of PPE, uh, the delivery of services, including nursing services, and uh, how some of the protocols might impact staffing, um, the scheduling of staff. Uh, one big area that is a concern is the cleaning and sanitation of buildings, particularly uh, will vary depending on how much utilization there is and what, whether we're in a hybrid, uh, where groups of kids are coming in in the morning or groups of kids are coming in at certain days and other groups of kids are coming in on other days. Uh, that will have implications for how we clean and disinfect the buildings. <coughs> we also heard about uh, some of the preliminary discussions regarding the remote learning model and what a hybrid model might look like. It's a particularly challenging discussion because we don't have state guidance. Mr. McHugh is uh, leading that discussion within his committee. Uh, we had a meeting today with administrators to talk about this and some of the chairs of the various committees try to create a format for our plan, similar to the strategic plan uh, format with uh, focus area, goals, objectives, timelines, one of the things we concluded is that everything relates to what the teaching and learning plan is. So if we have, if we know what the teaching and learning plan is, we'll be better able to identify the cleaning schedule, the transportation schedule, the, uh, the uh, utilization of procedures for temperature checks, for uh, bar, uh, loading kids on the bus, getting kids off the bus. Everything is really gonna be driven by which model are we doing? Are we doing a in-person model? Are we doing a hybrid model? We're partial remote, partial in-person, or are we all, all, um, <coughs> all virtual? So uh, we're putting the pieces together in that area as best we can, but we really need the state guidance, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Special education, Molly McGrath is really uh, at an advantage, I think, as an administrator. She may not feel that, but she has had the opportunity over the last several weeks to develop a pilot in our summer program. Uh, we're learning from that. It's going very well, as she reported. Um, and one of the things we know from the experience of remote learning is our special education students, our students with counseling needs and needs for related services, such <coughs> as speech, OT, and PT, have not benefited as much and, in fact, have somewhat suffered uh, under remote learning. So we have talked about the fact that if we are in uh, remote learning, we're hoping that there would be some modifications to enable those students to receive direct instruction in person at a minimum. Uh, we think that that's critically important. The transportation, buildings and grounds and food service, Mark Noth, Paul Bickle and Phyllis Sanford Krug. Uh, they, uh, that is a, uh, committee that's chaired by all three of those individuals. They talked about disinfecting and cleaning buses, the use of a Mr. Fogger. We have one in the district. We might need more. Insurances of appropriate PE, disinfectant supplies, uh, signage, uh, lunch being served. Uh, if we are restricted on large groups, uh, use of cafeteria might look very different. We may be serving lunches differently. Uh, the um, use of face shields for food service personnel, and the Health and Safety Committee, which is chaired by Mr. Bickle and Jeff Tooker, uh, identified some um, similar issues to what other committees had talked about regarding PPE. Uh, social emotional learning chaired by Mrs. Squalachi, it's a big concern of ours, not only for those students who were receiving counseling in school uh, prior to COVID, but for all kids. Uh, we are concerned about making sure that we have the social emotional supports to be able to provide support for all of the kids, either as they transition back, hopefully, or if they don't tr transition back fully, how do we help them to adjust to extended period of, um, of remote learning or a hybrid model. We are developing a broader survey. We just started that process this week, above and beyond Peter's survey regarding technology. I've asked the chairs of each of the subcommittee to contribute some questions they think relate to their area. 
We, in addition to needing state guidance, we would like to understand the concerns and to some degree the preferences of our parents as we consider each of these three possibilities. Uh, and we're hoping to <coughs> fine tune format for the survey and get it out with the help of Quest Arboses to our parents sometime within the next few weeks. Um, we think that that information will be helpful to understand what some of the challenges will be. Uh, particularly if it's a hybrid schedule and you have three kids, one at the elementary school level, the middle school level, and the high school level. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, hypothetically, there were days at which, or time slots at which your children were engaged in in-person learning by coming to school, and other time slots where one child is home in remote learning, and another child is in school <coughs> in-person learning, and you got to go to work. Uh, that would present an interesting challenge. We're honestly hoping that that does not become the guidelines and that the guidelines are a little more flexible to enable us to do something that supports the needs of our parents, but we just don't know yet. And Kim Bourbon is also on the committee and she talk, she has been uh, a listener and we're learning about uh, what their needs are as we have opened up the building at Janae for GCC and we've had no issues at this point. I believe there are approximately 35 to 40 kids in groups of 10 or less building right now and we've had no no issues regarding the utilization. I will say that the governor's presentation yesterday was both encouraging and concerning at the same time. Uh, it was encouraging that he mentioned the schools. Uh, it is July 7th uh, and it was encouraging that he indicated that schools, uh, uh, that all schools are required to have a reopening plan. Um, we have not heard that from our state education department. Uh, we have not received any written communication that those reopening plans should be developed. We don't know, don't know when they're supposed to be submitted. It is not until Ju July 13th that the Board of Regents will hear the report of the state task force regional discussions that occurred. And we are moving forward on our planning, but we really need some guidance to be able to know whether or not um, which, which option would be the most feasible, particularly as you talk about remote learn, or a combination of remote learning and in-person learning. <clears throat> I have to say the principals and the staff members involved in this committee, as well as our supervisors, are really eager to get going. Uh, we are getting going as much as we can without guidance. It has been somewhat helpful to have other state plans that we provided to the committee. Some are more specific and better organized than others. Uh, Sam Beersley was helpful in getting state plans from other states and we've distributed those to the committee. We're starting to look at them. Uh, and um, some of the groups such as SANES, uh, School Administrators Association of New York State have also shared sample plans with some of our administrators and we've made them available to our, our group. Uh, it's, it's, trying to, it's kind of hard to plan a trip or a course of action if you don't know where you're going. Right? And that's kind of the dilemma we're in right now. Sure. We're, so I've asked the team to think about the things that we're going to have to do under any of the three scenarios. Let's get them done now, like get, get sufficient PPE. Yep. Okay. What would the procedures be for entering and exiting buildings? Let's replicate some of the items that we've, up, that we've done in summer school, such as the temperature checks. We might have to bring those up to a larger scale, order more thermometers. Uh, we may have to look at the model of aides or teaching assistants taking temperatures before kids get on the bus. That seems to be working well so far, Molly, right? Within two days, right? We have the app through NERIC. The app through NERIC enables us to do the survey of the screening. Every employee does this in the summer school right now is doing a screening on an app. It's the three or four questions that you've seen regarding whether you've been exposed to somebody who had COVID-19, <laughs> whether you've had any symptoms within the last 14 days, any other questions. And that app, according to what I know, I'm talking to Molly, is working well. And it's giving us the data in real time of all of the employees in the summer school program who've been approved to be in the building. Peter or Molly, you wanna talk about the app? It's a, it's a little clunky because it's new, but I think it's gonna work for us. Jeff, I can just give you a, a quick update that 76 staff members filled it out yesterday morning for our first day of summer school before reporting to work, and it was very smooth. Okay, very good. 
and I can run a report and watch in real time who's completing it. So rather than stand outside the building and fill out surveys or have people turn in surveys, they can all do it on their phone. Uh, I think it will get better and even more efficient as, as we start utilizing it. So that is my report on the reopening task force. Our next meeting is July 13th, which will fall on the same date that the Board of Regents is meeting to hear the report of the state task force. Any questions for Jeff on the reopening? I just want to thank the groups that are involved, um, big time commitment, and uh, you know it, to have those options, looking at the state plans like you indicated, helps us at least see what other states will be looking at. Because uh, as Jeff indicated, the um, governor did make that kind of surprise announcement about having building plans, <laughs> I think, soon. <laughs> we'll keep throwing around, I think July 15th was yes. the date they keep throwing around. Yeah. But you know, a lot of us are just waiting for those, the guidance and don't want to have to shift gears uh, drastically to address those. Um, so hopefully we see some consistency in what uh, they're proposing. Kathleen? I also wanted to say thank you for putting all this together because when people out in the community say, so what are they doing? <coughs> we have pages here <laughs> of what you're doing. And it just goes to show that we're doing everything that we can at this point, but mm -hmm. still waiting for guidance. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a good, good point to make because, you know, in the community, people know who you are, know who we are, staff are asking questions. And I think as we have these plans developed, uh, asking the right questions, preparing as best we can, being proactive is the best approach for us to, um, you know, respond to whatever SED comes out with, um, and hopefully that's soon, and especially after the task force on Monday. So yes. a lot of folks will be tuning in. Yeah, okay. I actually get the questions from people at work who have school-aged kids whose districts aren't as far along as we are, so they always are asking us, what are we doing? So that they can kind of push their districts That's comforting too. to hear because I feel really behind. But. <laughs> <laughs> I, won't, I won't share which districts it is. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. We have had meetings organized by Craig Hansen with FEMA representatives, and I know that the business officials have also had meetings where the guidance has been very vague as to whether they're reimbursable. And we've just been told to keep track of it, and at some point we might get an answer. Or we might have to submit for reimbursement and see whether we get any fund approval or not. That's basically correct. Mr. Mann, I attended a webinar um, by FEMA and they talked about once they got talking about eligible expenses it wasn't quite as clear so I decided I'm just going to track everything and then they did talk about a potential reimbursement of 75% of eligible expenses so it's the eligible to get a little more information on and, there, and there's quite a big um, bit of rules around that. Yes. Um, so if you, like, they might not reimburse you for average cost, but they'll can reimburse you for the excess cost is what I keep being asked. So there's, there's a lot of rules around FEMA. The other thing that FEMA is dealing with, this is the first time they've ever had to do a pandemic before, so they right. don't know how to work. So they are keep saying just as a state, give us time to work this out. Right. So FEMA is very much
as far as the children are concerned, Mark, for the summer school, it was listed as an option. So we did purchase some child size masks in the event that parents didn't provide them and they wanted their child to wear them. Marissa, do you know how many we had what the status of that is right now? We have uh, enough masks to my knowledge for all of our staff currently that are, that are working currently in the summer. The, the executive order that came out when we were, uh, we were told to provide, that we could bring essential services back in, said we had to provide the mask for the employees. The summer school guidance said it was optional for the kids. Um, but we do want to have, a, if, if it comes to the point that we need them for the kids, we want to have a sufficient supply, so we started that process. We haven't had a problem lately. Initially, we had problems with supply finding uh, providers. We have not had a problem, to my knowledge, lately. We were able to get the thermometers, uh, the infrared thermometers, pretty quickly. Molly, how many infrared thermometers do you have right now? 25 plus 12. 37. 37. Thank you. Okay, so we have 37 for the summer school program right now. We were able to get gowns at the request of the nurses rather quickly. Jim was able to get those, I think, right? We have sufficient masks, gloves. Uh, our, our Owen Ball will be going to college soon, so we're gonna have, he has given us three orders now, I think, for summer school, for um, the, the nurses preferred to have a shield. So we got some additionals for the nurses. Speech therapists are using them. ENL teachers will need to use them. OT and PT as well. OTP, I think we have in the neighborhood of 30 shields. Is that about right? Yeah, and teachers are requesting them. Um, they find that the students respond better to their facial expressions than with the mask. I've also seen this new mask that has a transparent uh, <laughs> insert in the middle where you can see, so you can see the mouth. So that might be an option too. I don't, I don't know much about those, but wow. I'm sure by the end of all this, we'll know all about PPE. Um, we have gloves. We even have some N95 masks uh, in the district, so okay. that were un unutilized for the summer program. Hand sanitizer. We're, I don't know if Paul's on the meeting, but I think we're in pretty good shape with hand sanitizer right now. Um, yeah, I am here, um, okay. Jeff. We have. Uh, I've been able to get it in gallon forms. I've got uh, probably about 200 of the eight ounce. Um, containers, and I'm working on getting uh, the the wall-mounted ones, the refills, and things like that for them. So that's becoming more and more available. So we're in pretty good shape there. the The biggest thing I'm having a tough time finding is gloves. So for whatever reason, gloves seems to be the hardest thing to come about right now, as far as PPE. Okay. Yeah. Paul, how, how, do we, how are we doing with wipes? Initially, I remember in the March and April, we couldn't get any of them, but oh, do we have wipes now? I have a couple thousand on order, but uh, I've only got, uh, I, I got a hundred in the other day, which luckily was just in time for summer school. So we got those distributed as part of our plan. We wanted to get one uh, at least one container to each teacher. Um, and then Molly also asked for some extra ones for some other staff that's uh, involved in the summer school program. So we're, we're still minimally supplied, but we have a lot on order. So we're working on it. Thank you. As a member of the advocacy committee, I would say as we're talking about all of this, be sure to be talking to your representatives both at the national and the New York state level, even at the county level, because 
we see that this is going to cost us a lot and we're talking about the possibility of less state funding i mean i know that they supposedly know about this but i think everybody the american academy of pediatrics is saying they want the kids to go right. back you know we're talking about talking to the parents this is going to cost us so keep right. mentioning especially at the federal level, they're still arguing about it and they're still arguing about sending money to muni municipalities and probably schools. So it doesn't hurt to mention again that Absolutely. we could really use some help. Absolutely. I did about a month ago, maybe more, the, the former assemblywoman from the area that I moved from, from Rome, is the governor's OGS commissioner, okay. Rowan Destito, uh, and I know her. So I did contact her and make a suggestion that New York State bid out PPE on behalf of schools and give us a bargain price. And she had, she did respond to me and she does have her staff uh, looking into that. So um, if the state could buy it and bought from us and sell it to us at a cheaper price, or, and I, I know they said they were working on it. So, and, and I know that John McDonald has been in touch with us about some of these issues and um, you know, it's a point well taken in addition to the money if they could intervene and work on the pricing for us. Yeah. Well, we'll take help either way. Yeah, either way, <laughs> any kind of help. That's a good point, Kathleen, though, the advocacy piece, making sure our legislators know that, yeah. you know, I mean, I don't know if the, the BOCES superintendents are thinking about maybe some kind of report that would help say, you know, here's how much we've had to spend on, yeah. um, you know, additional supplies and things like that to uh, send that to some of our representatives and say, here, this is what it's costing us and we're not even in session. And we're doing these these um, you know, summer school and other activities to keep our our community safe, and um, it's it's not <clears throat> no. no. And if the it's the burden idea. is falling on the local, it's a good idea to account for our regional expenses and then send it to our elected yeah. representatives. Yeah, give them some idea what's what this is costing. Sure, good idea. Jeff, um, this is great information, and I think it's important. So the first question I'm always asked about that. I've had conversations with Mr. Leonard over the last 10 days because the New York State Public High School Athletic Association has initially issued some guidelines for uh, <clears throat> schools to follow for uh, school-based sports camps. And so if we're running a camp of our own, including our fitness program, at the, what, are the, what are the guidelines and what are the parameters? And they're challenging to implement. Additionally, Section 2 had a meeting last week, and they have six different options for restarting sports that I haven't reviewed in detail, but I did talk to Mike a little bit today. We were over here for the summer school. Um, they're looking at, um, in the event that they can reopen, uh, one of the options would be, obviously, shorter seasons that may start a little bit later than typical uh, to get the school year open, see how the school year does, to um, only playing within your uh, local area so you wouldn't travel out of your, out of your league, uh, so to speak. Uh, so no statewide or regional level competitions that bring you outside of the suburban council in our case. They're talking about one possibility would be to take sports that typically would start in the fall in the event that we weren't ready and either moving them later in the fall or doing two seasons in the spring with shorter schedules. So you might have, for example, field hockey and lacrosse back to back because the fall, by the fall we might not be ready uh, to do that but it would still give the kids a, an opportunity to compete in those two sports in spring, although the schedule would be very different. Mike's department is ready to go with registration information and um, information regarding the physicals and all of those kinds of things, but we're hesitant to put it out yet until we better understand the guidelines. Um, Jim, I don't know if you have anything to add. You might be more up to this, but basically there's six options 
They haven't decided on what options. And it's not clear as whether the New York State Public High School Athletic Association will call the shots, Section 2 will call the shots, or will it be deferred down to the league? Yeah, you pretty much covered it. They, they've talked about everything from the late start to no postseason play. Um, they talked about increasing uh, the season by one game because you wouldn't have the postseason. So they, they were talking about every possible option. Um, Mr. Leonard finished all the information pertaining to sports physicals, but we were a little reluctant to put that out because um, some of that information – uh, may um, send a message uh, that everything is good to go. And, uh, we just don't think that's the right time to send it out yet. The one big, uh, you know, for some of the sports that are permitted to play now in the summer, for example, baseball and softball can play right now, and there's other sports that have less contact where, uh, you know, independent groups, community groups are playing. The one... Um, the two sports that are uh, biggest concern are football and wrestling. Uh, and how would you, you – know, I know it breaks Mr. McHugh's two heart of the on the wrestling ever. and on the, <laughs> the, the football end, but, um, you know, those – how do you how do you operate those sports? How do you play those sports without the level of physical contact and exposure that is typical? I don't think it can happen. You know, the colleges are I can't have, talking I about – putting wrestling in the second semester and hoping that things clear it up by then. But, you know, we don't have the same, um, you know, uh, options that some of the colleges do <laughs> about changing calendars and, so again, waiting for some guidance. You know, the idea of pushing the sports back a little bit to give us time to hopefully develop a uh, – the safety protocols, I think, is probably the best. That uh, I, as a parent, uh, miss it. I miss the kids being out there. So, and you know, we go back to school. We're going to be okay. Yeah. Not COVID. Right. Just focus on COVID. And it is a lot to adjust. It, it wouldn't be a lot to adjust to social, emotionally, to return to school after being out of school for so many months, and then have a sports schedule and practice differently and all those safety protocols. It would be a lot of it would be overwhelming for a lot of kids. Yeah. <clears throat> we'll have to see what happens. Any other questions? No. Nope. Good discussion. Thank you for the report and I appreciate it. Yep. Moving to our next item, um, draft minutes from June twenty fourth. Um Michelle left early. Jen was a little bit late. I'll leave it up to your discretion how you want to vote. But um, for the minutes, is there any corrections, revisions that have to be for the minutes for June 24th? If not, I need a motion to approve the minutes. Kathleen, I need a second. Deanna, all those in favor? All those abstaining? I see Jennifer and Michelle abstaining. Very good. Approved. Right, we got five? At least five. Next item is approval of programs for resident children with disabilities. Any questions or comments? If not, I need a motion to approve that. Joanne, a second. Michelle, all those in favor? Approved. Reports and presentation to the superintendent? Nothing further. Nothing further. Uh, table motions, I have none at this time. Old business, board members, anything you want to bring up at this time? That's in the past. Nope. Moving to the consent agenda, we have um, items A through I. Any comments or questions, Mr. Simons, on those items or board members? Any questions? No. The only I did get a question, and it was a good question. We had appointed three staff members to summer school, and now we're asking the board to rescind it. Uh, those individuals, uh, one had an injury that enables them not to. They're not able to work. The other had change of heart <clears throat> due to personal commitments. No longer want, and one, oh, one had a change of heart, and one is left the district. Uh, Brandon Wagner is accepted a position in another district. So. Great. Any other questions on the consent items? 
I just want to note the uh, thanks Stewart's Foundation for a very generous gift to kick off kick off our year uh, $1,200 for the um, the libraries in the elementary school. If there's no other, and again, just a reminder, the school district wide safety plan is a preliminary approval, uh, subject to any um, comments and the revisions that we discussed tonight. Did you want to talk about the data protection? Yes, I was just going to do that. Thank Very you. good. Okay. Um, Mr. Goodwin is here. Mr. Goodwin has done an outstanding job as director of technology. He has absorbed uh, extra responsibilities as our district data protection officer. Uh, we were in the process of uh, approving some of the requirements for uh, Ed Law 2D, which is the Protection Act of the state regarding student uh, and um, other private information. And um, in discussions with uh, the EGAA, uh, they asked us to table it for further discussion and we've come to an agreement that some additional compensation would be warranted for Mr. Goodwin for absorbing those responsibilities. Uh, if you approve the consent agenda, he would be compensated for the stipend for the 2019-20 school year and the 2020-21 school year as we continue to look at the technology department's uh, organization and needs. And I thank Mr. Goodwin for the exceptional job that he does. Uh, he has taken on a lot, including types of activities that he's engaged in this evening that uh, we never anticipated. So thank you, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Yep. Yeah, it's a great setup here. I'm, you know, I'm, I was really pleased that we'd be able to get back on to some kind of a live format. And this, this is really working well. I hope that in the stream that the things are coming across well. And um, uh, thanks for uh, troubleshooting and getting things working well. And I like it. I appreciate it. Any other comments or questions on consent? If not, I need a motion to approve consent agenda. Jennifer, second. Kathleen, all those in favor? Approved. Consent agenda is approved. The uh, next item is any new business, board members, anything to bring forward at this time? Jennifer or John, you're good? Good, okay. Moving to the uh, public forum number two. Again, any emails? Nothing. Nothing. We'll then move to the Board of Ed forum number two. We'll start on my right with Joanne. Anything? Joanne's good. Kathleen? Deanna? Mark? Michelle? John? Good. And Jennifer? You're good. Thumbs up. Very good. All right. We do have need for an executive session for purposes of collective negotiations and personnel items. Um, we don't anticipate any further business after the executive session. We will need about 10 minutes to have Peter send an email to Mr. Dunn and Ms. Massey for the executive session. We'll stay right in this room. Um, and Mr. Budman. And whoever else, yeah, Don Budman will come in because um, negotiations. Seeing that, then I need a motion to move into executive session. Kathleen, second. Joanne, all those in favor? We'll move into executive session. We'll stay right here. Again, 10 minutes for Peter. And everyone have a great night. Thanks for joining us tonight in our reorganization meeting. And have a great night.